What's up, guys? We're here at Collision 2024 in Toronto. I have too much gum in my mouth. Hold on. What's up, guys? We're here at Collision 2024 in Toronto, the tech conference. And what better question to ask people than about X and Elon Musk and how he's been running Twitter? Are they for free speech? Are they against how Elon is running X? Has he taken it too far? Let's find out. Today we're asking people if they think that AI has the, the possibility to go too far in the near future, if it's dangerous at all, or if it's something that we should really harness for our own opportunities. I'm talking about like the very near future, the next couple of years. What are your thoughts on that? I feel we don't have the real AI just yet to ask that question. Um, real intelligence is not computational, it's not algorithm based. So if we're talking about some computational AI uh, having an impact on society for sure, and there's pros and cons to that, um, we're here today, by the way, to talk about the real AI, what's not computational, it's a digital nervous system that develops itself and has an ability to learn from the environment without uh, programming. So by doing that, what you get is a society of billion different AIs interacting with each other and not one big AI, big brother, taking advantage of you. And that's what our company AI Synth is doing. We're creating uh, an AI that will be personal to everybody, so it's a digital nervous system. So that way, if you think about it, that kind of AI cannot conquer or make you a slave or take away anything from you because it will be an enhancement of your personality, of that dog, of that cat. It's a digital system that will just evolve. It's a digital... Uh, living form. So if you position what's AI, AI is an intelligence that cannot be pre-programmed, that's able to have an answer to a solution it's never seen before, it's never been pre-programmed or pre-trained on before. It's about self-learning. If you and if everybody gets their own personal AI, then there is no uh, danger that one personal AI will come and you know create a problem for you. We've been talking to some AI people. Okay, you're talking to another one. Yeah. Okay. What if I told you the last lady, who I won't name, okay. said that they're developing a and what's the word? Um, a living AI creature that can live on its own and uh, you know develop its own personality. And she basically wants her company basically wants to create a world of. AI creatures that live, basically create a new be, be, living being of AI creatures that can live and learn in the environment. How do you feel about that? Um, oh, we got them. I think it would be super interesting to see in a reasonably closed environment. Yeah. Right? I mean, it would teach us, it could potentially teach us a lot about the, what the process of learning looks like abstracted away from any one given species. So it wouldn't be what learning looks like for humans specifically, but what learning looks like fundamentally. That's likely to be super interesting. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of other learnings we could pull out of that. But uh, past it being an experiment for learning, I'd be skeptical. And you're approaching this from one central AI, or one central place for data storage. What we're seeing is that there is no one, there is no one human being, or there is no one bee flying around there. It's a society of human beings or bees, and there's no one centralized controller of that society. So what we are advocating as a company is a society of AIs that Andrew and Andrew will control, and nobody else will be able to do so. It actually empowers you as an individual, as opposed to you becoming a victim to a system that will have your data, or will choose the search results on Google for you, or will know more than you want. So your personal AI empowers you to protect your identity in the society of computational AI that does exactly what you're saying. But if your company is creating the AI for that person, then when you ultimately have control? No, we're not creating. The person is creating the AI for themselves. One of you is my partner. The other is a sack of shit. Question is, who's who? So what are you providing then? Uh, we're providing the technology to create a digital nervous system that will not require programming. I mean, it will require programming for the servicing of the AI, but not for the actual digital AI. Because if you think about it, when you have a baby, and the baby learns to walk, and the baby grows into an adult, there's no algorithm. Nobody, a parent does not write an algorithm for the baby. Yeah, but the baby can't connect to the internet with its brain. Right, but the baby learns from the mother, from the father, from whoever is giving the information. This is how nervous system develops. It doesn't develop because a thousand programmers 
could foresee all the input that the baby's brain is going to get. So what you're advocating for, sorry, what you're advocating for basically is that each person has their own individual like program as an AI and they teach it stuff about themselves and therefore it helps them accomplish whatever they want to accomplish? Exactly, except for I won't call it a program. It's a, a living, digital, evolving form of any, of any nervous system, of a dog, of a cat, of a human, eventually will become a society of empowered, independent AIs, and not one big AI that will come and take, you know, your job from taking interviews from us, right? So, uh, so we're here to actually stand up for what's happening, uh, have a technology that will empower people to become their own AIs. Sometimes you go for a haircut and they ask you how far off the top or off the sides. I just say, give me the Latvia. How do you feel about the EU being able to make decisions for your country? Are you for or against that? Do you think it's necessary? Yeah, well, basically, these elections, Walter just mentioned, those are like the U European Parliament elections. Parliament yeah. Member, yeah, like which means that basically our country voted for a few members uh, yeah. from Latvia, which will kind of represent the whole country there. Uh, to be honest, like uh, as we are a really small, small country, uh, it's really hard to uh, have, an, have any impact there. Yeah. <laughs> And kind of like we are just uh, flowing, going with the flow. <laughs> so yeah, and I, I'm fine. I'm fine with that. Like, I wouldn't like yeah. it. I wouldn't like the if there was a North America union, I wouldn't want them telling my country what to do. Yeah. Well, well, it's not exactly. Like you're that. you're a big country, right? Latvia is a small country, and and uh, I think it's very beneficial for us uh, to be under you. Uh, it's very hard to you know. Uh, it's it's all about like inventing bicycles again and thinking you know you're, yeah we are a small country with big hearts and we will do everything better than the others and it'll be better in any way and we we want to go our own way. That's very ambitious, but you know there's there's uh, there's a difference between high ambitions and reality. And I think for us for Latvia it's it's uh, it's it's more it's very convenient and it's uh, it's it's nice to be under EU. That's my my opinion. I think Latvia can accomplish everything on its own. I think Latvia is one of the better countries in Europe. I believe in Latvia, you guys. Dimitris, I believe in you, okay? You've come to this country, you, you said, I don't care who's in this country. You probably said you don't even like Canada, right? No, I and then, like Canada. <laughs> I told him, it's the same like Latvia, and I love Latvia as well, so basically. He hates Canada. No, I'm just kidding, all right? Thank you, guys. <laughs> Immigration too high? Uh, absolutely not. We need a million people to replace all the people leaving because of the baby boomers from the workforce. Over the next five years, a million people leave every year for the next five years. We're way too short. Our GDP is going to shrink and collapse. You asked the wrong person with that. Not necessarily. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We need more immigration if Canada is going to survive, period. And we need to get that happening right away. As to how we're doing it, you might be doing it wrong. I agree with that. Uh, but I think there's a whole bunch of really cool mechanisms that Canada has developed and they're underutilizing them. So we work for the government of Canada, Sean? No, but I should. <laughs> uh, next question, how do we lower housing prices then? Is it just as simple as building more houses? Do we just build infinity houses? They can't seem to do it right now. What's the solution to higher cost of living? So your assumption is that all houses should be lower cost? No, my assumption is that housing prices have exploded in the last two years, as has immigration. So you're connecting those two dots, and I'm not sure that they're necessarily connectable. Okay. Because the media has connected them, but the fact so, is, housing prices are raising already, and we're blaming immigrants for that problem, which is not why blaming immigrants. We're blaming the government. We're blaming the government. Yeah, yeah. Well, the government's blamed for everything, right? We can blame. They're, they're an easy uh, pa uh, patsy for that. Okay. But the fact is, is that immigration doesn't isn't a direct directly proportional to housing crisis. Okay. Uh, number one is that immigration tends to be a problem in places where for example, we have a lot of students moving in, so a lot of the student-oriented places like Toronto and Waterloo, et cetera, have housing crises. You don't see that in Sault Ste. Marie. Oh, the housing They're... prices are insane in Sault Ste. Marie. Yes, they are. Well, it's not oh, as yes, bad they as are. downtown Toronto. Oh, well, nowhere is as bad as downtown Toronto, but you can yeah. say that about a lot of places. That's the housing true. prices all across Ontario are insane. Yeah, we should stop building streets and start building elevators, like the rest of the world has done. Interesting. Japan puts a lot more people in the same in a lot less space and they don't have as much space to use. We just are so used to having so much space that we tend to want everybody to have a giant so lawn. So people shouldn't have large lawns? What's with that? You can't have a lawn? No, a lawn is a serious Hey, Lynn, how do you feel about that? Lawns or no lawn? What do you prefer? I like my lawn, I guess. She likes her lawn. Sean wants to take your lawn away from you. How big a lawn do you actually need? I don't need a big lawn, no. I don't need anything 
How many butterflies and bees are you willing to kill so that you can? It's like, her do, right. Like, she wants to wants have a big lawn. Why can't she have a big lawn? Because we need the space to put up some elevators. So we, we need the space so we can cram more people in. That's what you're arguing right it's now. It's just the idea that having these giant lawns, which is what everybody wants, they want their giant lawn, and then they spend the rest of their weekends doing something meaningless, which is mowing their goddamn lawn. Immigration, too high? Yeah, I, okay. <laughs> I would say it's gotten too high. Um, personally, I work in, I own a staffing business, and it like benefits me personally. Like yeah. most people that we're dealing with are, are PRs. Most, uh, I, it's a tech staffing business too, right? So, but there's got to be some kind of reasonable limit. I, I don't think the Canadian infrastructure is able to kind of absorb the numbers that we've got coming in right now. Now, the last guy we spoke to with green hair, I'll note footnote that, <laughs> said that there is no correlation between extremely high immigration and housing prices and cost of living. Would you agree or disagree with that? I would disagree with that. And why is that? It's a supply and demand issue, right? The more people that we have coming to the country, the more uh, demand there is for housing. Higher equals higher rents equals higher housing prices. I should have had Jeremy with me against the green haired guy. <laughs> Yes and no. Okay. Infrastructure is not growing as fast as they're coming in. Many people and diverse groups of people and people immigrating are no problem at all. But for that to happen and for that to be sustainable, you also have to have the infrastructure. Do I believe that infrastructure is uh, growing as fast as that? No. And I, Is that an issue? Yes. Immigration too high? Uh, I don't think so. I'm an immigrant. Okay. Hey, let's go could still think it's too high if you're an immigrant. You would like to qualify in any way, shape, or uh, I think qualified immigrants add a lot to an economy, and uh, I think you should increase immigration if it's, you know, they're bringing a lot to the to the economy. I agree with that in theory. How do we feel about that? I agree. I'm also okay. an immigrant. From? Uh, Ireland. Ugh. India. Ugh. Go back to Ireland. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> I'd like to take the time right now to do another, another land acknowledgement took a run colon tow as you can see we've got a whole bunch of meaningless stuff um, most of the activism stuff we haven't seen here at collision but one thing is for sure there has been room for you know race-based <laughs> entrepreneurialism and as well here is pretending that we care about native people that's basically what this is this is um, a, a, a fake activist thing of the Anishinaabe, where we pretend like we never succeeded the land and that we never lost a war, and we monetize that. And that's basically what all of that is about. Sir, do you agree? Well, if you go to the Rogers Center and you see the land acknowledgement they have inside of there, that's written by an activist group. Uh, it's written by one group. You could call them activists. So it's not, an, it's not activism to... F to get well, a gigantic corporation. Not according to the Canadian government. They might be activists to you. But Is the Canadian government, like that's just one group of people. Well, yeah, but you, you said activists, so whatever that means. Like, that means a person who is purposely wants to get that message to support their narrative. Well, it's I not just know. some guy who's just Activism like, this not, is the fact no, and no. therefore nobody can argue no. with it. So, so right now, like in Canada, just like in the US, you can't change your amendments easily. You can't, no. Right, exactly. You can so change laws. Canada doesn't have a law. real constitution. So they made into law, for better, for worse, and it's not maybe even our generation, right? They made it into law, so you got to live by it until someone changes the law. Yeah, but do you believe it should be changed? Well, what reason do you have to change it? You're just avoiding the question. No, no. Do but you think that a, a, like, there should be, do you think reserves should exist? Why do you want to change it then? At this time. I'm asking you if you think that it should be or not. Why can't you answer that? No, no, but it's not me. Like It is you. I'm asking you. Do no. you think that they should be I allowed or not? No, but we, for most of us, it's there. Yeah. Uh, we haven't thought about whether we should change it or not. Lots of people and thought about that. Have you thought about keeping it? Yeah, Would of course. You, do you want to keep it or not? You don't want to keep it. You're just turning the same question around on me that you're not willing to question. Now, what about people who might have concerns about AI taking away too many human jobs? How do you feel about that? Oh, well, certain things are inevitable if you're not ready to understand that cheese has moved <laughs> and you need to move 
uh, and understand uh, that you need to uh, find new cheese. But I think that the risks of not utilizing AI now potentially exacerbate those long-term risks. How do you mean? For example, if we don't utilize and develop now, then we're going to lose out in the long term to other markets, to other people. So I think it's going to bring a lot of money, but at the same time it's going to take a lot of money out of the market as well. So mm -hmm. there's like a really good, sorry, good part of it, and then there's a bad part of it, which some companies may lose because of the AI doing what they were doing before. So AI, it's like, uh, like water in the sea. You can not like it, but anyhow, if it goes against you, you will drown. What about people's concern that AI will take away too many low-level jobs? Fast food, grocery store, maybe gas station, I don't know. Is, is that a, something you've thought about? Uh, yeah, sorry, at that time, when AI will take those jobs, it also could provide education. So people would be able to get education easier, so they will also could apply to more professional jobs. Um, I think it's a good, um, what they've been doing so far, what I've seen, it's so far so good. Um, obviously, I don't want, you can't really replace people at the end of the day. I think we'll always need people to work, but I guess it does make systems faster. So I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think we have to remember that people still are important to businesses as well. We're asking people if they believe that Elon has managed X well in terms of freedom of speech and his political positions. Very loaded question, I know. Um, how do you think he has managed it, for better or for worse, allowing almost anything to be said on the platform? How do you feel about that? Uh, I think we all have the freedom of speech, right? Yes. As long as we don't violate other people's freedoms or, or beliefs, I think we should be fine. Um, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's, uh, yeah, he's ruined the thing, you know, by, by uh, I don't know, it's, uh, you know, it's a complete mess, I think, and, you know, to be honest, I'm afraid of opening the app, you know. Um, I'm, I'm not like a sensitive, I'm a big, big man, obviously. But, you know, it makes me sensitive by, you know, seeing that, that stuff over there. Uh, I think it's a mixed bag. So to answer your question, I think it's good to have more freedom and not, you know, ban people at a whim. But at the same time, I do think you have to have some moderation to try to keep some discourse and also prevent, you know, and combat false misinformation. I think it's gone a little bit too far, but I think he did make the right move in terms of making sure that people can really speak their minds. I think now it's just a matter of like going back a little bit more and finding the balance because there's certain things being said on Twitter that uh, are a little bit tough. Well, who would be in charge of deciding what's acceptable? Exactly. Right? I think that should be determined by the laws and uh, we should have a range to say what we want to say within legal guidelines. And what would you say is your most controversial opinion? <laughs> I mean, I, I believe in free speech, for sure, yeah. I, I, um, what What's the Voltaire saying? I I, uh, I may not agree with what you say, but will defend your right to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, 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 I might not defend it to death, but yeah, I believe in that, yeah. Um, I think that people like Elon, Sh I think it's great that he's upholding free speech. Um, but yeah, I might not agree with everything that's being said, but I think there needs to be a platform that allows that. Uh, to a certain extent, for sure. Yeah. What's the extent go to, do you think? Uh, well, there's all sorts of things that people can, uh, especially with children, children on social media, right? So they use uh, a lot of things like uh, bullying and stuff like that that we experience. So I don't know if you guys have kids or not. But. Would you be in favor, either of you, of putting an age minimum on social media? And what would that age be, do you think? Absolutely. I think that's essential to have on. I think at least minimum age 16, um, simply because there's so much hate speech, bullying, all that stuff. I feel like 16 is sort of the age where parents can have those conversations before their kids get on social media. Up until then, I just don't think they're ready and parents might not be ready to have those conversations. So for sure. Do you re Are you really for free speech or do you think that people shouldn't be able to say anything they want online? I'm for it. That a girl. I'm for it. Yeah. yeah. What about you? Of course. I think you should continue what he's doing. And you want to elaborate? I have. I mean, I'm not an Elon fanboy, but I think private company, do whatever you want. I guess live life. He's earned it at this point. Simply, I think that the stance on free speech specifically and the way that he's handled that at X is more of a marketing exercise than anything else. I think he's just drumming up controversy because it makes headlines. Well, I mean, he's the head of uh, uh, Twitter of X now, and he does 
like he has to he almost has a control of like that that, that media platform so Easy owner. yeah and I, well I'm not I, I, I don't read a lot about uh, about that so I don't have a lot of um, info uh, Damn. <laughs> I don't think you want to have unfettered ability to just advertise things that are patently false or patently call for violence so I think a line has to be drawn there. Smarter people than me can probably discuss and debate where that line exactly is, but I think you have to have some limitation, but you also don't want it to turn into, you know, George Orwell's 1984 on the flip side. Um, I, I gotta say it's a little bit in between. I think he took on this social platform as a fun project for himself, not really in his innovative style. and. I think it's just a fun project. I think he could have used his talents for something else or maintaining his current companies. All right, thank you very much. What else do you want to say? What else do you want to talk about today? I don't know, Elon, complete your projects. <laughs> you know, really um, really get that, those trains going, fix your Teslas. Like, we love your innovation, but you gotta, you gotta complete those things, bud. If you look at history, there are a lot of really great people that have done some amazing things. Um, and you could probably say that, and probably people in the future will say that about Elon. Um, obviously, a lot of people will say the opposite. And if you're an entrepreneur, you know that very well. You know that you're going to have equal amounts of haters as you will people that are, that are lovers and maybe a little section in the middle. So, you know, good for him that he's willing to take that heat and do things that will bring that heat. So, Elon, you have an ally in Joe Catan Albert from Snow Group. All right, guys, we're wrapping up here at Collision 2024 in Toronto. My throat is raw. Everyone's opinions on real estate and immigration are wrong. Their, their opinions on AI were pretty good, I'm not going to lie, except for who, Mystery Camera Person X? The crazy Soviet Union scientist lady. She was wrong. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to look at the Patreon links in the subscription. Like, share, subscribe, all that stupid old YouTube stuff, and we'll hit you next time. Remember, I wouldn't lie to you, except for maybe this once.